Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 28th of the sixth month on our Creator's calendar as we comprehend it, which happens to line up with the 9th of September, 2023, on the Gregorian calendar. And we're continuing with our reading of the book of Bereshit, or Genesis, that we've been covering for the last few weeks. So, or we haven't gone over the last few weeks, but we've been reading it beforehand. So, for a recap, we just went over the sojournings of Abram before he was named Abraham and his leaving his father in Haran, going through the land, going into Mitzrayim or Egypt, if you will. And what happens to him there as a type and picture of what would happen to his children later on as part of the first age where they were sojourning before they were given the covenant. He goes into the land or he goes into Egypt. His bride is taken from him and he is persecuted by the Pharaoh. There's plagues in Pharaoh's house and problems until he releases Abram and gives him booty and wealth. And then he goes out after plundering him. And that's a type of what would happen with his children later on in a larger scale. But <clears throat> we are currently on chapter 15 here. And it says, after these events, the word of Yahuwah, which is our Mashiach, right? That's a title for him. It says, the word of Yahuwah came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your reward is exceedingly great. And uh, after we do this reading, maybe remind me, I have a Facebook post we put together of Yahuwah, our shield, who's also the anointed or the Mashiach, who's like the sun, and it all ties in with the things that scripture has to say about who he is as well. There... If I remember correctly, there's also a psalm from the Psalms of Shalomo, or the Psalms of Solomon, they call them, which are really war chants that were made around the uh, time of the Maccabees. And I believe there might be different references in the Thanksgiving hymns, but I'll have to look. Anyways, he says, I am your shield, your reward is exceedingly great. And Abram said, Master Yahuwah, what would you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, See, you have given me no seed, and see, one born in my house is my heir. And see, the word of Yahuwah. Richard? Yes, brother? Uh, you might explain what those, those uh, little blue letters are. I don't know if everyone understands it. Sorry about that. So this is the, yeah. not just regular Hebrew. Right. This is the the Paleo Hebrew, as it's called, uh, version of the name of our Creator, Yod, He, Wa, or in modern Hebrew they say Vav, and then He. This is where we get our letter Y our phonetics or our sound for our Y, I, and the J bifurcated from that. This is where we get the letter for E, but the sound for hey, like the H sound. And if you remember, we had talked about that before, the hey being a vowel sound is still reminiscent, or you can see it in English because they'll say unhonor or unair and they'll have a n instead of just an a which you only do in front of a vowel the wa here is the letter this became the letter f right the digamma from the greek that was dropped but the letter the character became our f just because just like this character became our e but the sound was the o or the u or the w Right. So uh, it, we have it carried down in different ways, but the, the paleo most closely represents what we have in English for the, the font, the modern. The modern Hebrew, the, the Chaldean flame letters or the block letters, as it's called, that was an Aramaic script they, they adopted after the captivity. 
This was the original. It was brought into uh, Europe, into the, the Greek-speaking peoples, which is a mixture of the sons of Yepheth and the Hebrews that migrated there by Cadmus, that's known in antiquity. And he brought the letters into the Greeks, and the Greek brought it over to the Latin. And the Latin was originally adopted eventually in the English, although they carried it down in Germanic, in rune scripts, and in the Celtic languages as well, in different ways. Um, that's where these characters come from. So I try to use the Paleo because that's how he wrote it with his finger, to the best of my knowledge. It was not written in the pictograph form on the 10 on the, it, that I'm aware of. The oldest known writing of the Ten Commandments anywhere in stone is in Las Lunas, New Mexico. It dates to the round of the time of Dawid, or 1000 BC, and it's written in the Paleo script like this, although it will have like the Yod reaching down with the arm going up, almost like a backwards H. So it's a little interesting. <clears throat> but that's that's his name, Yahuwah. Literally, he who or he will... And then hua is to be, to cause to exist, to fall about, right? So he who causes it to be is what his name means. It says in C, the word of Yahuwah came to him saying, this is not your heir, but he who comes from your own body is your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look now toward the Shamayim or heavens and count Sefer, the stars, if you were able to Sefer them. And he said to him, so are your seed. Now, this is both the a singular, because we know that the seed singular represents our Mashiach, and the story in the stars is all about him. But this is also the multitude of the literal seed that would be innumerable like the stars and the sand of his children who are like the children of light who run the course set before them, originally brought out by the seed of Abram and the promises given here. And you can see them talked about as like the stars running their courses during the time of judges when they're fighting Sisera, for example. They're also mentioned as the children of light in the visions of Amram, which is the father of Moshe, Aharon, and Miriam, the son of Kohath, the son of Louis, who got that vision while he was in the captivity in Egypt or during the time they were in Egypt or Mitzrayim. So they would have been aware of those things by at least that time. But it, it my point is, it means both, and the context is, of, it fits for both. It says, and he believed in Yahuwah, and he reckoned it to him for righteousness the belief that the seed would come from his loins. He believed and it was righteousness to him. And he said to him, this is the word of Yahuwah who is speaking. The, the man who appeared to him that we'll see in a minute, right? This is, I am Yahuwah who brought you out of ur Kazdim. They usually say Kaldin, right? And we've gone over that before, but for those aren't, that aren't familiar, Kadoshi or Saint Chaldean was the name of the, the man who brought the good news of our Mashiach to a remnant of Hebrews in the highlands of what's called the highlands of Scotland today, but was what was known then as Caledonia. And it was called the Caldu or the Chaldees or the Caledonians because of him. When he brought the good news, they adopted the, the name of their nation after his name. Before then, they didn't really have a name for their nation because they weren't really publicly known. But all of this is made known in the ancient history of Caledonia, which is a record of these Hebrews from their leaving Egypt right before the birth of Moshe, founding Troy, and then the righteous survivors, their journey from Troy to Crete, from Crete to Sicily, from Sicily to Gaul or France, and then from there to Mantrojan or Moentros, of the highlands of scotland uh, they're just one wave of hebrews that spread out and they were just a remnant that kept traveling and keeping what they called the laws of the altar but they were such a thorn in the side of satan and rome for such a long time that they vehemently hate them 
And they hate him so much, they made every English translation say the Chaldeans when talking about the Babylonians here. They revile the McDonald's, which is why we have a garbage restaurant with that name today. Um, they go out of their way to to everything that's Chaldeonian to make it despised and little and, and mock it because Satan's vindictive. And you can see that even today. But this word right here, where it comes from is Kazdim. It was originally the, the name of the, the Kesed who founded that city. And that word in Hebrew, Ka, is like or resemble. Remember, as a prefix, it means to be like or to resemble something. And then Sadim is the word for demons. So to be brought out of the light, the demon like light into the truth is where he delivered him from. And if you remember, it was in this place where he had the writings of the watchers that he passed down to his children, what the Babylonians, uh, eventually what we called astrology that came from Babylon. It's one of the pillars of witchcraft. And it was from this gentleman here, which is to be like demons, where you think that your fate is determined by the courses of luminaries instead of what you choose to do. Something that which sounds... is a perversion of astronomy. Yes, it is the perversion of what was originally intended that was given to the Hanok and that he wrote down. But um, it's one of the pillars of witchcraft, and it's one of the things that they're that we all have to be brought out of. It was soundly refuted in the recognitions of Clement, also, and I believe it's Book Ten where they're talking with their father and his friends about these things. Uh, the father of Clement, Nasita, and Aquila, who were all separated when they were younger, but reunited when they came to the truth and the good news was brought to them. Which is why the book's called The Recognitions of Clement. He, in the course of writing about the preaching and teachings of Kephas, he went around refuting Simon the Magician, who had turned apostate again after coming to the belief. Um he recognized and first discovered his mother, his twin brothers that had been separated from him, and then his father. So he got his entire family back after losing them when he was young. It was also a, a, a testament to the fact of our Creator's loving kindness on those who, even in error, hold to chastity. But uh, back on point. Kazdim is to be like demons, and he was brought out of the demon-like light, or Kazdim, to give you this land to inherit. <clears throat> and he said, Master... Hey, might I say something? Absolutely. It, it goes along with what you're seeing there, um, talking about Avram coming out of or of the Kazdim. If, um, if we continue on the story and we see... Um, with, you know, Isaac and Rebecca, and we see Jacob with Leah and Rachel, and we see Laban and Bethuel. There, there's a whole, Laban and Bethuel are related to Abraham um, through his brother Nahor, I believe. And um, I can't remember his wife. Anyway, the, I think it's Milka. Anyway, the point is that there's a lot of idolatry and um idol worship and paganism and stuff going on in that family who had stayed back in in the place where abraham come came from and we see a lot of issues with idolatry into the that comes into the uh, the family even with you know rachel putting the the household idols under her when she's you know on her monthly cycle etc and so they're there yeah this just it, it confirms what you're saying is there's a lot of idol worship and demon worship and bad things happening back where abraham's from and it's awesome to see that Yah separates Abraham out of that and brings him out. Absolutely. Hallelujah. Thank you for that. And that is something that we're going to go over more, both in the course of the events of reading through here. And it goes into even more detail with those things in the book of Yobelim. It's like a second witness to what we'll read here. So we'll get it twice over with a little more context. It's It's really amazing when you think about what the patriarchs walk out here and the effects that it has on generations later on, because it absolutely plays out 
and um, both the idolatry with the uh, the family that would not repent, or anyone who's not familiar, just to recap here, we'll see in Yobelim, Abraham from a young age turned away from the idolatry that was prevalent in the land there. And it was actually his father who was the priest in that place for the idols. At 14, he tries to confront his father to turn away from that stuff. And his father said he knew, but if he tried, the people would be unreasonable and rise up against them. So he tried to talk to his brothers who got angry and he was just quiet about it. But he actually is the one who set fire to the house of the idols when he was 65 or when he was 60, I believe, sorry. And it was, um, it was what his brother Haran died trying to save the idols from the fire that caused his father to leave that area and name the place that they sojourned to as Haran. But while they left, um, his other children did not get rid of the idolatry. And it was married into the, the family three times over, if you think about, Yitzhak's wife was from there. Yaakov's wife was from there. And then you have uh, Levi or Louis, who also married his wife from the sons of Laban. Troublemakers. Uh, yeah. everybody. And Absolutely, brother. I put it in the chat. I, I have a personal belief. I can't really necessarily prove it. Um, but it may be true. I think that's why these women had such an issue with conceiving is because in their bloodlines, their parents were worshiping demons and whatnot. And I think that it physically affected the next generation in the seed line. And so they needed intervention from Yahuwah, from their husbands, you know, praying and trusting. We see that in all three cases with Abraham and Sarah, with Isaac and Rebecca, with Jacob and Rachel. We see that they're having issues. Even Leah. Even Leah's womb closes up at one point after the first four sons before she bears the next three, you know, listed children. So I think there's a connection there. And that echoes down through history. Noah, uh, Menoach and his wife with Samson. And then uh, Z Zakariahu and his wife, Elisheba, when they're in their old age. So it's not just with the people in themselves, but that is an excellent uh, suggestion. You have different things going on generational curses the way that it works how things function it, it, it always is has he established so when you base it off of what he said fourth generation then things will happen you can go all the way back to genesis and see how that played out just with the patriarchs there too where you have um his chastisement and correction of the inequity to the fourth generation and then you have the benefit and baraka from there for three generations before it's proliferated the same thing that you see with um, the 10 leading up to Noah, and then with the introduction of idolatry up to the liberation of it from Abraham to the third generation with Yaakov to proliferation. So and that pattern repeats itself also. But um, it, it was not just the personal walk of these people, which it absolutely was. The things they chose to do, how they chose to be, not only determined when they could have children for a woman, how you treat your husband, but also the pain involved and the different things that are in how all those things play out. But you also have that it's foretelling the future of what would be for their children. So everything there ties together. And thank you for pointing that out. I really appreciate that. If you guys have anything else like that, don't hesitate that to, to bring your insights, your comments, your questions or whatever you do, because it only helps the body. Richard. I should like, if I might, uh, it, it something that I should have said earlier. At the end of every gathering, I would like to see what everybody else might have an opinion about it. I would like to have a time of reflection on what we went over, whether I learned something, didn't, you know, just, you know what I mean? If that's what everyone wants to do, I don't mind. I'll Feedback. Probably, I'll probably have to cut off a little earlier then. <laughs> which well, I just think it's nice which, that we can find out what whether or not we're 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 personally growing or something I learned or something because I again I appreciate as you do the the comments. Thank I think, you. I think it's a great idea, Earl, and uh, 
I think some congregations or fellowships call that a midrash. Right. All right. Well, if you want to corral me when you think that we should start wrapping things up to do that, I don't mind. I can't always pay attention to the time, though. I don't think we'll get past this chapter, however, today. So, When did you start paying attention to the time? <laughs> when uh, Pearl and Jeanette were here, sometimes they'd, they'd want me to just go and go and go and go, and it can get pretty long sometimes. But uh, that's not always appreciated at home or abroad, I imagine. You, you, you read, we'll keep track of the time. All right. I don't think I stopped that recording. I'm sorry. We've been going the whole time. It's okay. People can get some little insight. So I'll go ahead and continue. It says, and he said, Master Yahuwah, speaking to the word who came to him, whereby do I know that I possess it? And he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So the three years for the three ages for the three patriarchs, right? You have the heifer, which is like the bull, the cow, right? The goat for the sin offering, the ram as like the leader among the flock, the turtle dove or the, the dove, the innocent one, and then the one that's offered. One goes free and one is offered, just like the uh, reminiscent of the repentant robber and the one who reviled him when they were hanging on the stake together. But these are all foretelling different things. If you look at what these represent, then they make sense. You look at what the number foretells and then you can put them together. You learn about the three ages by the parable that he gave. You learn about the um, how they tie in with the patriarchs in the book of Gad the Seer chapter 1 where you have Gad's vision of our Mashiach, where he also hears the song of the Lamb, which is talked about in Revelation, and it goes along with the song of Moshe from Exodus 15, 16, I believe. One of the two. But we'll get there. This is, and he took all these to him and cut them in the middle and placed each half opposite the other, this would be the 15th of the third month, which we'll see. It mentions that specifically in the book of Yobelim, or what they call Jubilees. <clears throat> it says, but he did not cut the birds, and the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, and Abram drove them away, which is something that he had done as a boy in the land as well, driving away the birds. If you know what birds represent, and what they were doing to the seed, it's all a parable of things that would happen. Literally, every every story in here is like a parable of future events. If you just take the meanings of the words, both of the names of the people and of the things that are involved, you look at what Scripture says about them. Like the birds of prey or the ravens is the same as the curse of darkness in Egypt, if you didn't know. There's quite a few things where you can see what these words are playing out as in a uh, a different way that's rather enlightening. But the narrated stories in here are, are telling us things about what would happen later on. The messenger is messing with the seed and causing famine, both literally at this time and later on with his word, right? Sounds like you're talking about wheels within wheels. Yes, absolutely. Which is also what you can see in the constellations, right? You have the, the 12 stars, the moving, the wandering stars of the planets. The, the, the planets is Greek for wandering star. It's the ones that are not fixed in a set orbit, as in all of them that circle around the uh, Polaris there. But the wandering stars keep their own separate orbits. <clears throat> Wheels within wheels, however. So it says, And the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. And it came to be, when the sun was going down, and a deep sleep fell upon Abram, that see, a frightening darkness fell upon him. I believe it's in Baruch where it says that he was shown 
the Shemayim Yerushalayim at this time as well. And he said to Abram, Know for certain that your seed are to be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. But the nation whom they serve I am going to judge, and afterward let them come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you are to go to your fathers in Shalom, you are to be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the inequity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And just for context, it, when he has Yitzhak and he's weaning him, by the time he's five years old and he's weaned, he's first scoffed at by Yishmael, or literally afflicted, as a sojourner in a land that's not his, which would happen to his seed for 400 years. And from that point, when Yitzhak was five years old, to the bringing out of the children and Moshe standing on that mountain was exactly 400 years. It was 215 in the land of Canaan and 215 in the land of Mitzrayim that they sojourned total, which is a, another topic for a different time. But it's also something we've covered before on here, so there are videos on it. And we can share that for anyone interested. But here we go. It says, And it came to be, when the sun went down and it was dark, that see a smoking oven and a burning torch passing between those pieces. On the same day, Yahuwah made a covenant with Abram, saying, I have given this land to your seed from the river of Mizraim to the great river, the river Euphrates, with the Canite and the Kezanite and the Kadmonite and the Hittite and the Pezerite and the Raphaim and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Girgashite and the Yebusite, the seven nations stronger and mightier than they are, right? Um... I don't know if you want me to continue or not. We got 20 minutes before noon. I can. Why Just... don't we mid crash? Okay. And. Uh... All right. I just want to mention one thing about this. In the covenant here, which is also in Yobelim, and it's spoken about elsewhere. Abram's required to do nothing. It's a covenant between the father and his son on what he, our Mashiach, will do for his bride and to accomplish the, the, the promises that he's giving to Abram. As to, to assure in his mind that these things were so, because he could not do anything greater, he, he made a covenant and then he, he swore an oath that he would certainly accomplish the things that he said for him. And when we get to the book of Yobelim, uh, chapter 12, you'll see Abram's prayer, the very things that he asks for, just like the very things that Louis or Levi asked for, was given to him. Just like our Mashiach said, if you ask, it will be given to you. So something to keep in mind for us as sincere believers, it, it, the same is true for everyone. However, thank you all for your time. You have a wonderful day. and. We will see you next week. They knew how to, they knew how to take care of sheep and goats and bulls and rams and all these things. They they knew what they were doing. That it wasn't just their occupation; it was their lifestyle. They would sometimes go out there and sleep with them and whatnot and protect them. We see this with David talking about you know killing the lion and killing the bear and stuff like that. But we also see something very interesting with Jacob is that he goes to his uncle Laban and <laughs> and he he knows the the flocks and the herds and um, everything so intimately that he actually dupes his uncle Laban after his uncle Laban dupes him, you know, with with uh, marrying Leah and Rachel. And so then he dupes his uncle Laban and he walks away with almost all of his wealth in the flocks you know he makes a deal with him and he knows the flocks so well and the interbreeding and everything that he takes away almost all of his wealth like these people knew the flocks in and out 
and they had ways of knowing how old they were. Um, I know in modern, you know, American whatnot, they'll, they'll put certain um, like dashes in their ears or something like that, or certain marks on their ears in order to mark who owns them, you know, maybe a certain um, seal or, you know, might be placed upon the animal or cuttings in the ears and whatnot. So they, they had a way, they had a system, they knew, they knew how big they would be at the third year, or maybe they had some sort of numeric value or some clipping in the ear. They, they had ways to know how old these, th these creatures were and if they needed to keep them and continue breeding them as part of the flock, or if they needed to cull them and, you know, eat them um, and whatnot. So that, that, that's what I have to say. These people knew what they were doing. So finding a three-year-old heifer, three-year-old that Abraham was on it, he knew, he knew what he was looking for and his servants knew what they were looking for. So the idea of getting someone at the right age or the right appropriate size sacrifice was not an issue for them. And to just for continuity's sake, it wasn't recorded. Brother Earl had asked for why a three-year-old heifer would be chosen and if they would even be able to know that that was uh, the animal's age, to which our brother Jeremiah was answering that. So thank you for that. Now, I had a question. Would... Um, would it be something that they they keep their flocks um, separated, obviously, not all of them mixed together, but would they keep age groups apart too? Are you familiar with that? Or is it something that they would have to go amongst them to find it and get the right one to bring out? I'm not super familiar with, um, with shepherding, but what I read in the scriptures that these guys were experts. They, they had a system. They knew what they were doing. So that's, that's about all I know. And I also understand that we have forgotten that here in the West. We've forgotten all of these things. Those over in, you know, the Middle Eastern area, they might still know these tips and tricks that are in the Bible that we can't conceptualize because we we don't intimately know it like they do. My dad raised cattle. My dad raised cattle. He knew which year he could tell you that calf was born, that cow was born. Da, 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 da. That's that belongs to that mama. You know, he knew, he knew. There we go. Yep. Awesome. Thank you for I that. Had an opportunity to go to Israel, and we were coming from the Dead Sea area up to Jerusalem. And uh, there were still huts or you know, tents like you you would could have been Abraham's tent. Uh out in the in the field, it wasn't field, mostly rocks, rocky areas. But the uh, some of those uh, Palestinians or Arabs were still out there, like they were two thousand years ago. It wasn't a bit of difference living in their tents out in the hills. Fascinating. I was going to mention the Bedouins and the the flocks that they still have today. I imagine, right? Yeah, but living in those tents, just like they would have three thousand years ago. yeah not paying taxes we didn't get to go over a whole lot today but was there any other comments or questions about things i know um not too many people are overly familiar with all of the allusions or direct mentions of our mashiach in the original covenant writings but i'm sure all of you know that he's called the word of yahuwah the the word that was made flesh from the book of yahukanon right there in chapter one and also the name which no one perceived except himself, and his name was called the Word of Yahuwah, is right there in the book of Revelation. That's kind of the key. You can go back all the way through to the beginning here, and you can see that all the foretellers, the Word of Yahuwah came to them. The Word of Yahuwah came to Abram. And that is just like a code name, just like when you see the, the Yahuwah of esteem, or it calls it in the Hebrew, Kabod Yahuwah. They translate it usually as uh, the Lord of glory, right? That's a title for our Mashiach because he is the one who was esteemed that is called Yahuwah. He was made bodily and men perceived him. Um, that, those things are explained. Yes. Those things are explained in like Irenaeus, the apostolic constitutions, the uh, the epistles, they're plainly talked about, but it's not always uh, explained correctly. So if you have anything, if you have any issues with that, 
Go ahead and ask, or you can share. There's no problems. A lot of this stuff. The, the scriptures. The scriptures talk about uh, the slave who decides he wants to stay with his master, gets a little hole put in his ear. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of master and servant, or master and slave, uh, is kind of lost in America because we're so anti-slave. But I, I, I honestly, uh, it's so much easier once I surrender. Uh, thy will be done, not mine. It just takes a load off of you. Done. Hallelujah. Was there anyone else had comments or questions about what we did? Midrashing, as our brother said, before we wrap things up. All right. Well, I'd like to say welcome to all of our family members. It was fun. Glad you were here. Hallelujah. I, I agree. I appreciate all the input, uh, the extra faces, and uh, I always enjoy the fellowship. So until we meet again, you all have a wonderful Shabbat and a Shavuot Tov or a good week ahead. So thank you for your time, and we'll see you next time.